So, it's about two years ago, and I'm sitting in a small room with a stranger, watching them use technology, and other people are watching me watch. This is what I do. I help make it easier to apply for a credit card online, or to book a flight, or to watch a show. I'm supposed to be making technology better, but it isn't working out so well. Every day I read a new study about how technology is ruining our eyesight, how it's disrupting our sleep, how it's actually making us feel anxious. And if I had a longer attention span, I would list more, but you guys kind of get the idea. <laughs> so I'm kind of freaking out because I got into this as an optimist, thinking that technology could change the world. So here I am wondering, what am I gonna do with my life? And into my study walks Matthew. And after a little bit of small talk, we both huddle around his phone and I ask him to give me a tour, kind of an icebreaker activity. And after he shows me a little bit about what he's doing, he comes to the photos and he hesitates for a minute. And he says, you know, you're, you're gonna think I'm kinda weird. And I assured him, I said, no, weird is just secret code for interesting. <laughs> but inside, I was sort of like, mm, I've been doing research long enough to know, like, I don't know what's gonna be coming next. But he pulls out photos and he swipes through photo after photo after photo of butterflies. And I take a deep breath, oh, okay, it's butterflies. And yeah, I say, and then I put on my best research face, so tell me about this. And he says, well, the last time I saw my father, we were sitting on a bench together, and a butterfly landed right on his shoulder. And it was kind of this magical moment. And I guess after he died, I wanted to recapture a little bit of that magic. And I didn't have that many photos of my dad. So I started taking pictures of butterflies. Every time I'd see a butterfly, I'd take a picture. I started learning about butterflies. I started talking to other people online about butterflies. And people who hadn't seen me for ages would start sending me pictures of butterflies. So I guess with my phone, I'm kind of like a modern-day butterfly collector. That session was cut. The client didn't know what to do with that, but it stayed with me. I thought, I wonder if people like Matthew can teach us all something about living well with technology. After all, research tells us that if you eat more yellow foods or say words with the long letter E, like happy, um, or if we all get cozy in the Danish style in a Huga, we could be happier. So why couldn't technology be adapted for happiness? So I decided to do what I do. I decided to study it, and this was great, because normally when people ask me what I do, it's really super confusing, <laughs> and they don't, they don't get it. But now I could say, oh, I'm studying happiness and technology. And I thought people would just be sort of lining up to share their inspirational moments with technology. Well, as you can imagine, that didn't quite happen. Instead, people would roll their eyes or they'd kind of step back from me and go something like this. Don't you mean technology and unhappiness? And so I set out to find happiness and our conversations quickly became kind of a healing circle for Facebook sufferers or a guilty confessional of Netflix binges. And I realized that a relationship with technology had to be managed like some kind of chronic condition. And so, so I thought, okay, this isn't going anywhere. I'm gonna try something else. I decided to ask people to track their highs and lows with technology in diaries online. And so after a short amount of time, 
these diary entries piled up, and I had thousands of these, and I thought to myself, uh, how am I going to go through all of these diary entries? I have to come up with a theory. So one theory I had was that maybe people who are living well with technology are taking a break. Maybe the way we heal our relationship with technology is to kind of step back from it. Maybe then we can experience those fertile stretches of boredom, you know, like back in the day when boredom really meant something. <laughs> or we can enjoy fine things like vinyl records or paintings. Or maybe instead of obsessively recording our kids' band concerts with iPads from start to finish, we can appreciate them. Now, that one's kind of a stretch. <laughs> I'm sorry, kids. Um, <laughs> but I started looking through, and sure enough, there were some people who were taking a break. They were going phone-free for an evening. They were going phone-free for a weekend. I had one person explain how they went to kind of a summer camp for grown-ups, where they deposited their phone in a basket for the weekend. I had other people who downloaded apps to get off the other apps. <laughs> However, <laughs> when I started looking at this, I realized that even something like a simple walk through the woods is haunted by this world in our pockets. So with each step we take, we're aware of notifications accumulating. We are thinking about all those emails piling up in our inbox. And then we look down at our feet and we realize we're walking. <laughs> and that we want to know the tally of those steps in our health app. Finally, we look up around us at all the beauty and we think, oh, such a shame. Such a shame I can't take a picture of this and share it with several thousand of my closest friends. <laughs> or we look at the tree and maybe we even think, I wonder if there's a Pokemon thing behind that that I could grab. So even this walk in the woods is framed by our experience with technology now. So in internet speak, our existential concerns are underscored by lolcats. Okay, so our cycle of, good. So our cycle, <laughs> this, this idea that we can just take a detox may not work. Our brains might be differently wired. But seriously, isn't there something more redeeming that we could be doing with our time? Couldn't we be, say, reading a book? And yet, we're obsessively reading as we wait, as we walk, even, unfortunately, as we drive. Couldn't we be having deep conversations like we used to? And yet, we're aggressively social. It's just now geographically distributed. <laughs> so, okay, that's not going to get us anywhere, and maybe I should look at the people who are taking the other perspective, and they're going all in to the pull of digital. You're probably feeling the gravitational pull of your phones right now. I know I am. The force we're all exerting right now in this room to resist pulling up mesmerizing videos of coins spiraling down a wishing well, which will then lead us to search for the relationship between gravity and dark matter, which then somehow transforms into a tongue-in-cheek post about how dark matter is actually coffee, after all, that will then magically evolve into a desire to superimpose a caption over an image and share it with about 500 people, that force is real right now. <laughs> so it turns out that actually, I didn't see too many examples of people going all in. For whatever it's worth, that rush we get from a notification or that quick hit of happiness we get from cat videos doesn't turn into big picture happiness. And there's a reason for that. There's kind of a dark side to technology. A lot of the technology that we use is developed to be a little bit addictive. Friction is smoothed away, persuasive techniques are honed, algorithms are tweaked, 
And the result is that business success is measured in these tiny interactions of clicks and scrolls. And it's taking a toll. So the cycle of binging and fasting isn't really getting us closer to happiness. We eat, we pray, but despite obsessively swiping away at Tinder, we're not finding love in this situation. And so I thought, well, okay, what can I do next to find out about this? Because this really isn't getting me anywhere. And so I had people submit their guiding principles with technology. And I got a lot of good advice. Some of it's like this, which I'm going to lean into very heavily when these videos are posted on YouTube, and I'm tempted to look at the comments below. <laughs> Some of these were a little cheeky, but very prescient. <laughs> Don't act like a robot to interact like a robot. I might use that in the future. But most of them boil down to something like this, that technology is at its best when it helps us to be our best that rather than following the next arrow, we need to follow the meaning. Now, as I was going through kind of this evolution, I discovered that a few other people are starting to research the positive effects of technology now. So I found a study of Carnegie Mellon researchers that found they tracked about 2,000 people on Facebook over three months and found that the quality of their interactions had a measurable impact on well-being. So people who were using Facebook to connect with friends and family were doing so to positive effect. Another academic study on Instagram, and yes, there are academic studies about Instagram <laughs> now, um, found that the simple act of taking a photo can enrich our experience. So while we may not enjoy looking at other people's photos of lattes, taking a picture of our own latte may help us to actually enjoy it. <laughs> so it seemed to me like there was something here. We're happiest when we bring together these two realities. Rather than marking a divide between this is real life, over here with the vinyl records and the books. And this is our digital life over here with the lol cats and the notifications. The best moments are when who we are and what we do and what we're feeling all sync up. It sounds really simple, but it's not quite that easy. There's a reason why we restlessly cycle from email to Twitter to YouTube over and over again as if it's our new form of breathing. It's because technology is designed to keep our attention on technology rather than to invite reflection. Rather than creating white space, a kind of mental white space for us to reflect, it's pulling us in deeper. Now, it doesn't have to be designed this way. And a lot of people theorize that, <laughs> don't try this at home. <laughs> If you take away anything, <laughs> don't try this at home. But a lot of people theorize that when we lose the screens and technology becomes more about wearables and chatbots and who knows, maybe ingestibles, that some of these problems will disappear. I don't think so, not, at least not entirely. I don't think it matters whether the technology is in front of us or on us or inside of us. I think when we bust out of this cycle of hype about the next new thing about technology that inevitably kind of leads us down the road of dystopian rumination where we contemplate the coming end times where human beings are collected like robots by super, collected like butterflies by super intelligent robots who have a wry sense of humor. What we find is the best moments are when technology and well-being meet in those spaces where we create meaning. So we are in this, we're only at the beginning of our journey with technology. We haven't had a generation live and die with the internet yet. Most of the technology that we use has not been around for more than a year. And the actions that we take every day shape technology so that what we do and what we choose not to do teaches the algorithms. What we say and how we feel is 
recognized by the people who are developing technology, people, many of whom care very deeply about our human future of technology. So my hope is this, that we think about our interaction with technology as a dialogue with human potential, and that we, instead of having unplugged days, try to engage in meaningful ways, that we rebel against the things that don't work for us intellectually, emotionally, or spiritually. And in this way, together, we can create a new, more positive technology. Thank you.